Love it. That is a good and really practical thing that people could just start doing tomorrow or yeah. whenever after they've listened to this episode. So I really love that one. Yeah. I might well do it myself, actually. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to How to Take the Lead, the podcast where we challenge the myths and stereotypes of what it means to be a leader today and help you to succeed in post without compromise. I'm Lee Griffith and I'm Carrie Ann Wade and together we will be your guides questioning everything we've ever learned about leadership, sharing our experiences along the way and inspiring you to make a real impact in your role. Visit howtotakethelead.com for show notes, past episodes and to join our community. Enjoy this episode. So hello to everyone who is watching us on YouTube. It's lovely to have you here. For those who are just listening to us, hello, um, just listening to us. Those who listen to it, you are very welcome. And that is a noble pursuit you are doing to take I know, we don't, we don't like the just. Nobody's just in anything. You're not just a listener. I, I feel You're privileged. a valued member of our How to Take the Lead community. Yes, I feel privileged that you decided for us to be your uh, listening companion whilst you clean the house, do the dishes, walk the dog, drive to or from work, however you might be listening. And we'd love to hear how people do listen to us. Um, So you are very welcome here, uh, as are our Substack community, where we have a bit of a offload, download, whatever you want to call it over there. On each episode, we give little extra sneaky bonus stuff and prompts and things we haven't been able to talk about. Usually it's one of us in a bit of a reflective mode, having come away, thinking about what we've been talking about and and what the other person said. So we share our thoughts over there. So you are very welcome to join us. All the said links that you need will all be down here somewhere or in the show notes if you are listening on said podcast app of choice did i rescue myself there you did you rest yeah you dug yourself back out of the hole you started digging well done <laughs> <laughs> how are you this fine fine day carry on i am good thank you very much lee i'm in a sort of i do not not reflective headspace but in a like i feel a bit like oh I need to, you know, been doing a lot of thinking. What's what's coming up next for me? How do I need to get on top of the things that I need to achieve as a leader and in the workplace? So, yeah, I feel like I've uh, so far had a good week. Thanks very much. How are you? Was it was it the disruptive episode? You were so in awe with my ripping up. Well, the yes, yeah, it did you... take me. It did take me a week to pick my chin up off the floor when you said you'd ripped your to do list up. So you know, obviously, after I got over that shock, I needed a good sugary tea um, to sort myself out. I thought, yeah, why why not start disrupting your own self for yeah. your thinking? What you what you want out of life as a leader? So yeah, it's all been good. Thank you. How about you? Hashtag Lee? influenced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are now officially an influencer. That's all I'm going to say. Love it. I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm yeah, I'm I'm enjoying the vibe of twenty twenty four. So I was about to say twenty twenty five. Obviously I'm not in the future. I'm enjoying the vibe of twenty twenty four. And uh good. Just yeah, find finding my feet, finding my foot in, throwing things up in the air a little bit, but also not really doing any of that either, because consistency and persistence are my buzzwords for this year. So Oh, I'm liking it. I, I've, I'm, we're well into the year now, and I'm yet to I think know, what so. my <laughs> word of the year is going to be. So that will be my reflection for after this episode. Okay. Well, we it, today's episode feels a bit like a, a natural extension um, to to the discussion of last week, which was all around disruptive leadership. And this one, I want to explore the topic of taking risks. And I think it's one of those areas that can be really divisive because mm. some people absolutely love taking risks, living on the edge, <laughs> as it were. I, I, by the way, I'm not going to throw myself out of a plane or anything like that anytime soon. I might give you some some indication to the <laughs> level of risk I'm willing to take, at least in my personal life. But others, I think it, it brings out a, a fear and... Uh, I was going to say, has you rushed into the bathroom? But after last week's episode, I'm I'm going to keep. Don't go there. Don't go there. Ch- change tack. Change tack. Quick. 
but you know, bring bring you out in hives. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's say that instead. So it's I, I think so. I think there's there's that element of how people react to the thought of taking a risk, and then I think there's the element of what people see as risk can vary as well. So inherently, the job you do might have high risk. I mean, we've both come from used to working, but we both have a health service background, mm. for example where the decisions that people make and the actions that people take have a life and death consequence. Um, but other risks could be financial, reputational, legal. There's all sorts of ramifications of the decisions and actions that you take. And so I wanted to discuss this topic today, A, because I think it builds on the, the, the areas that we touched on last week around disruption, but also because how you manage risk directly affects the performance, but you know your performance, your team's performance, your organizational performance, and high performing organizations are those who are willing to take risks. But how do you get comfortable with being that type of leader? When do you know if a risk is worth taking, and what if you're just too risky kind of person you know so that's that's what i want to explore in today's conversation so kicking us off carry on um so that everybody is starting in the same place how have you defined risk in your c- career i guess this is quite an interesting one for me and where i started when i was thinking about this question was risk being about weighing up the potential gains or the potential good uh, that could be caused through something versus the harm. Um, So what's the potential gain versus the potential harm of doing or not doing something? Sometimes it's actually about making a choice not to do something and that can be as risky as choosing to do something. So that was kind of where my head first went to in thinking about that question. And then I guess I kind of brought it back down to me and my own career. And from that perspective, I I did reflect actually. And I feel like from a career point of view, I have probably been quite open to risk because I've been very open to new opportunities, to pushing myself outside of my comfort zone for going for things and doing things that I might not have done if I was more risk adverse. Um, I'd also say that I'm, well, yeah, you all know this for sure. And so will other listeners probably. Um, but I'm, I'm also not a perfectionist, which I think sometimes means that I might be a bit more spontaneous or a bit quicker to perhaps put things out there before they are fully formed in terms of an idea, mm-hmm. a way of working, something that I'm hoping to achieve. And I would say that especially so in on the business side of my career and in the collaborations that I'm part of. And I feel like I do that almost as a way of forcing myself to do the things that I might otherwise feel were too risky. Because if I've declared them in public, then I need to be accountable for that and and make them happen. So that's kind of been one of the ways that I've dealt with risk in terms of risk to to kind of my development and growth as a co- as a leader and in my career. Um, I have to say that personally, as I've progressed in my career, I think I felt more able to take risks the more I've thought about what's the worst thing that can happen if I do or don't do this, what is the worst possible outcome? And as long as for me, the level of harm isn't incomprehensible or dangerous or going to cause death. And as you've said, working in healthcare, a lot of the time is a life or or, or death kind of sector to work in. If it's not dangerous, then for me, there's always been something about, well, why would I not try this to see what happens? I guess the one area as I was reflecting that I'm probably, I probably am more risk adverse uh, to than other areas though is definitely been when it's come to money. So things that have been finance related, so whether that's salaries, so personal to me or to other people that I'm working with in my team, whether that's about budget, 
that's been the area probably where I've been less kind of laissez-faire about things and I I reflected on whether or not that's been because a lot of my career has been in the public sector and for me that's other people's money so that's the taxpayer's money um, that I'm having to be responsible and accountable for so has that made me think that the risk there probably needs to be more measured and and weighed up in a different way so that was kind of the rambling thoughts that came to mind when um, when I was thinking about defining risk in my career to date. And I'm not sure if that's where you were expecting some of that to go, yeah. but that is what kind of came into my head. Well, there's definitely a few things that I want to unpack as we carry on with the conversation. But to bring it back to a, an organisational level, why do you think it's important for leaders to be more aware of risk and t- taking risks? And and I do say this as two separate things because I think that they are. I think you have risk in what you do day to day. Yeah. But then you've got those bigger strategic risks related to decisions and actions that you you, you yes. have to take as a leader to take an organisation forward. Yeah, I think you're right to separate the two because there's the inherent risk that comes through leading an organisation, whatever that organisation might look like for your organisation, a lot of which might be outside of your own control. So risk can happen because something is happening in society that is causing that potential risk to your organisation. That, you know, going back to finances, that might be a cost of living crisis. And what's Mm. the risk to your organisation of operating in that space? versus um, the risks that you might decide to take uh, to progress your organisation, to respond to something, to make an improvement. So I definitely think that separation from an organisational viewpoint of risk is an important one to take. I think in terms of risk as an organisation, it's important for you to be aware of and considering risk because it will be about how do the things that are happening, Mm. what's the potential impact they will have on our organisation and is there an opportunity to ready ourselves for any of that and prepare for it? So whether that's in an emergency planning capacity, whether that's in a business continuity space, whether that's in succession planning, what, you know, whatever those risks might look like, are you as an organisation ready to take action if you need to, to help mitigate some of that risk and make that risk have less of a negative impact for your organisation? I guess in terms of the other element about sort of risk management and that feeling a bit different, there's something for me there about what's your appetite as an organisation and leadership team to take in risk if that is going to help you progress your strategy in the direction of travel you want your organization to go in because I guess there's that you know the age-old adage isn't there that if you do everything if you keep doing everything the same you can't expect a different outcome so if as an organization you're hoping for a different outcome there might be a level of risk that your leadership team your board your organization needs to be willing to take and you need to have had conversations about that so that you're actually making decisions from a place where you all understand each other's point of view around yeah. how you're going to move forward. And as you you mentioned earlier, there's there's also the decision making around if we do nothing, we take no action, that in and of itself, awareness of risk, because organisations, if they don't progress, they they don't stay still, definitely, they go backwards in, in many ways. So um, there is that thing around, yes, we might find comfort in keeping to doing what we've always done and and this is why there's that link with the disruptive leadership and discussion we had last week but um you you need to have that awareness that that no action has risk as much as taking an action or a decision yeah sorry that (laughs) we sat there I think, were you waiting for me to respond because I was like I absolutely agree with you Lee tends to go like I say something Ah! you then like bounce off of it we we interact but that's that's fine no I just it's because I agreed with you and I was thinking oh yeah Lee's right there and then I was all right sorry I was I was mulling over what you were saying and then my my silence was consent as in I agree with what I agree with the point that you've just made sorry Lee that's fine that's fine I'm only trying to run a bloody plus podcast here it's fine (laughs) 
Oh dear. Um, so one of the things that I do with um, my clients are disc assessments, which people might have heard. And it's a, a psychometric profiling tool that I find really helpful to understand communication preferences and how teams work with each other and how individuals react in certain situations, particularly in, in such situations of stress. Um, I know you've read the book Surrounded by Idiots. Other people might have read it too. And if you have, you'll be familiar with the different colour types that they use, um, which are the same colours that we, we use yeah. in DISC. So what's clear if you've done the test or if you've read the book is that people will naturally have certain types of preferences or strengths mm -hmm. or, or things that they'll call on in certain areas. And then they'll have to learn how to lean into the other areas. And, and as we always say, like any strength becomes a weakness if overused. So you have to learn how to balance them all. So in, in DISC, in, in the kind of colours, a, a D, a red type, is someone who's pretty directive. They like to get on and take action. They're more like, likely to feel really comfortable to, to take that risk. Um, or they'll take actions actually without even thinking through risks. Um, so, you know, the positives of that type of person is that they tend to get stuff done mm -hmm. and get it done quickly. The flip side of that is that they can land an organisation in hot water because they, they move w without thinking too much. And then you've got, I suppose, the, the opposite side of that, that personality type, which is a C, a, a blue type, where they're careful and cautious and they focus on the compliance and they're going to be the ones that are super aware of risk and they're likely to be trying to mitigate them as much as possible for the organisation. So that means in their mind, they're protecting an organisation. But to others, that might be seen as stifling innovation. Um, they might be delaying and slowing things down. It could be really frustrating for people having to interact with that. And obviously, you've got varying degrees of, of people that, that sit in between that. So I'm interested, Carrie ann in what's been your approach to risk and how comfortable you've felt in taking. I know you've mentioned some of this already in, in your, your approach, but that was kind of the for a personal lens, when you come to like lead in an organisation, lead in a function, sitting around an executive table, how how comfortable have you felt and what type of role have you played, I suppose, when looking at those types? So I think for me, there's definitely something about the importance of diverse thinking and, and approaches. So I think what you've demonstrated with the couple of examples you've given of, if we could call them the red and the blue, um, they're at different ends of the spectrum, different extremes. <laughs> what have I made I, you laugh about? Because you said the red and the blue, I've instantly got an earworm, which was um, the red car and the blue car had a race. <laughs> Remember the old Milky Way? I mean, again, do, yeah. another niche reference. Another niche bingo. reference. If you, yeah, the bingo cards out. There's uh, there's one for you there. Um, I was like, what have I said now? The re the red car and the blue car had a race. Absolutely, <laughs> do remember that. And it's making me want to eat chocolate now. So yes. I'm trying not to be distracted by the idea of a Milky Way. Um, so I think uh, other um, chocolate bars are available for them. Yeah, but I mean, if, and if any of them would like to sponsor us, feel free. Um, uh, sorry, I've sorry, totally I've lost my train of thought you. now. I've you have. You. Um, I was thinking about the importance of that diverse mix of thinking and approach in your leadership team. So I'm uh, not a red and I'm not a blue. If uh, I go by those um, kind of uh, scores and descriptions in, in discourse surrounded by idiots, but it's important for me to have that mix in the team that I work in because I think that's what leads to the best types of discussion and challenge around the risks that you might need to take as an organisation. Because um, if you had a leadership team that was full of people who weren't really that bothered mm. about the risk and were just going to crack on and do it, that would be potentially hugely dangerous and damaging. If you had a leadership team in an organisation that were all people who were completely cautious and risk adverse, you'd probably never take a risk ever and your organisation would miss miss out so I think we've mentioned in other episodes of the podcast that that diversity of thought and diversity of approach in a leadership team being really important so I think the teams that I have seen operate uh, 
is best the right way to say it the best teams I've seen in terms of considering and thinking about risk have been uh, the teams that do have that real mix in so I see my role in a team often as the person who will provide some of that constructive challenge and hold the mirror up and say hang on a minute have oh do we feel comfortable that we have considered everything here um and let's just do do that check in so i i feel like that's where i've been in terms of being in some of those leadership teams some of the more challenging teams i've seen are those ones where the dominant approach and leadership style is is one or the other and nothing in between actually um so yeah th- sorry because i was still thinking about milky way i'm not sure sh- i'm sure i'm probably waffling now no. but it's not full on risk all the time and it's not playing it safe all the time yeah. um and the challenge i think has been when you've just got a room full of people who are very similar in terms of their type well i i was thinking as you you were talking through there that what i wrote down was psychological safety and how much uh, yeah. risk taking is uh an important outcome of having a psychologically safe organization and again if we go back to high performing organizations yeah. high performing teams they have high levels of psychological safety that they feel comfortable to challenge each other in taking risks and yes. it's and it's not about them you know shouting down each other's ideas but it's the constructiveness of that and feeling able to to raise questions and whatnot and so you're right um if you're in a, a position where there is a domineering force there's unlikely to be safe safe circumstances mm-hmm. in which that can be challenged and then the, the whole kind of concept of risk and what you'll probably get in that type of situation is all the types hunkering down to their type even yeah. more because that is where they know that's their comfort. They're not they won't be willing to kind of spread their wings a little bit into the others. So yeah, that's a really in- interesting point. What does good risk taking look like to you? In the teams where I've seen it work well, um, and felt that it's worked well, it's definitely been about um, open conversation so maybe it's back to your point about that psychological safety open conversation uh, feedback and discussion where you really feel like what you're talking about is weighing up the pros and cons of risk um, and it's about doing the due diligence so not just doing things on a hunch or a like instinct and sometimes instinct is a good thing please don't get me wrong but I think in the context of what we're talking about it is about that due diligence yeah um Bal- so I that, say balance insight yeah. with intuition yes absolutely I think that is a good kind of scale actually to get the balance right with so uh, and I think that that counts whether you are talking about it organizationally or if you are thinking yeah. about your own personal self as a as a leader and your own individual career it is about that weighing up kind of what's the feedback telling me versus, you know, what do I think is the right thing to do here? So I think that level of openness and transparency in conversation is important. And going back to what you said about DISC and your sort of profiling, understanding how the people who are decision making in the room with you actually operate and communicate is really important to be able to have that constructive conversation and constructive, constructive challenge. Because I think if you don't take the time to understand where other people are at, you're never going to have the level of debate you potentially need to talk about risk. And I think organisations that genuinely do actually talk about things like risk management, risk appetite and check in on that as a leadership team, you know, that that's where I feel like, oh, we're in a good space because we're not ignoring risk. We're actually having a transparent conversation about what risk means for our organisation and how we might mitigate risk whether we have an appetite to take risk so it's that kind of language as well that I've seen kind of actually in play um where it feels like that's that's a good thing for the team and the organization yeah I think I don't disagree with with what you've said um I would add to it that there's something for me about how you align risk and and in the things that you were talking about this is absolutely is what would be happening aligning that risk to your organizational purpose 
yeah, and then that what thing around for? testing testing it with the insight is almost that checking in with well, what do the people you serve think is most important so you're taking risks around the right things for the good of the organization and the people that you serve yeah so that alignment needs to be there with like actually what is it that you're trying to achieve yeah. what are you here to do yeah um and then i think there's something for me about the measures so yes you need some element of uh, information to help you with decision making around whether to take a risk or not. But you also have got to be clear of how are we going to know whether this risk is a worth mm. continuing with or stopping or, you know, have we seen what we've wanted to see by taking the actions that we take? And then there's something about how you manage people's expectations along the way of taking risk. And being clear, and again, it goes back to other conversations we've had about um, failure is okay. Like, it, just because we're taking this risk doesn't mean it has to work. As long as we've got mitigations and da da da, and we're not going to yeah. cause real and actual harm. Um, and so sometimes we might decide we need to retreat, or we might decide we need to take a different tact, or or whatever that might be. But having that clarity in stepping into the decision is is really really important and i think then knowing along the way what my checkpoints when will i know if it's if, mm. whether we go or or stop or pause or whatever yeah. it may be. And, and that measurement isn't it how do you know then how do you have a conversation and how do you measure whether the risk was worth taking or not so you might take the risk but actually did it achieve the outcome that you were hoping it would and, and the intent that you wanted and actually if you don't do that evaluation piece then you're actually going to just probably be in a team that not takes risk for risk's sake but that yeah. is taking risks without actually knowing whether there's any benefit to take that risk and you just has too many risks in this yeah. then you just risk repeating that again without knowing whether it's going to work there was yeah. definitely too many risks yeah. in that I was getting tongue tied I was, I was getting uh we need a policy about policies to write a policy <laughs> yeah. kind of vibe there yeah <laughs> Um, so we've touched on the pros and the challenges in risk taking. Mm. How do you start as an individual to identify where you might sit on a risk scale? Let's say, you know, zero, you you wrap yourself up in cotton wool and, and those poppy things. I can't think of the word. Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. <laughs> We're creating some sort of couture fashion item here made of cotton wool and so, bubble wrap. So that's your zero. <laughs> your 10 is, you, you know, you're jumping out of the aeroplane with no parachute and you don't really care. Like, how do you figure out where where the scale of, of risk you sit? <laughs> <laughs> I think intuitively you probably know from just hearing you describe that, if I'm honest, Lee. You probably know if you're a one, a five or a 10 or somewhere maybe a little bit in between. I, I think it's about... Um, considering and having insight into the way in which you take and make decisions uh is definitely an important part like of working out how risk adverse or how much risk appetite that you might have I'd, as always there's something about seeking feedback because actually you might perceive yourself to be a hugely risky individual and very open to taking risks and you might ask some of your nearest and dearest colleagues it'd be like oh come off it you like always got the safety harness on yeah. so there's it's, definitely it's usually the ones that go oh I'm so risky you're like mm, you're just yeah. not wearing socks today Fred come on <laughs> <laughs> it's like that when people describe themselves as quirky I'm like are you allowed to describe yourself as quirky I'm not sure you're not, you're not it if you <laughs> call yourself it yeah yeah so there is something for me about kind of seeking that feedback and test it testing that out and I guess it's kind of how many times do you ask yourself the question of like, what's the worst thing that can happen here if I make this decision? And how many times do you feel comfortable or uncomfortable in those conversations and decisions you might be having with yourself or with your wider leadership team? And when I talk about comfort, I guess my caveat would be, I don't mean around your professional integrity, because often if you feel like your kind of professional integrity is feeling a bit uncomfortable there is probably something in there about this not being quite right but there's some I mean more about like are you just coasting along because it feels safest or easiest or are you pushing that and 
feeling that level of discomfort about maybe just doing something a bit different and taking that risk. Yeah. And that and that's the link with the disruption piece that we mm. spoke about last week, did wasn't it? Um if you're perhaps someone who is risk averse and you think that maybe you are holding back your organization or your team, how do you start to shift your thinking and approach? I think there's something for me about being able to purposefully ask yourself that for me it's always back to like what's the worst thing that can that can happen because I think often again I don't want to talk too much about what we talked about last week but it's that fear isn't it there's a, yeah. there's a fear of taking the risk so I think if you are able to pose the question to yourself and to others about what's the worst thing that can happen here if we make this decision I think that's a really good starting point to start testing how much risk you might be prepared to take and where you might be able to push the boundaries of your natural comfort state of risk for sure and I think there's something for me you talked about the sort of evidence didn't you and and seeking Mm. that feedback there is something about making sure that you are able to weigh up the pros and cons of that risk by by having that intelligence to hand to kind of do that checkpoint so I think that that's the bit that might give you the layer of comfort to be able to be uncomfortable about taking a risk because you're like actually I've seen that there's some evidence behind this and I've been able to kind of look at that and review that before I take the risk yeah yeah I think they're really important and and it's it's, there's quite a lot of reframing there isn't it that you have to do to to step into what might feel more comfortable for you I think the, the thing I'd add is this trying to understand and recognize when you're being too attached to something because often we won't take risks if we're really invested in whatever it is that's that's there that's already there or that's happening you're more likely to try different things if you don't have the same investment in it um which i know can be a hard thing to consider particularly when you think about well, the investment of an organisation is its purpose and its mission and you want to align everything to that. I'm not saying that's what you throw, throw you don't throw that out of the way and, and go, well, I can't be invested in that anymore. But it's more about like we get invested in the mundane is the wrong word, but I can't think of another one, but like structure and process and again, like with the disrupt- disruptive episode, you know, if you've, We've always done it this way and you you get too attached to the stuff that doesn't really matter. Yeah, there's a comfort in that though, isn't there? That's your comfort place. Cause, and, and I often have seen this in leadership teams where actually rather than focus on the bigger picture yeah. and the risk you might need to take to get there, because people feel nervous about taking that risk, it's easier to get, I know we use this phrase a lot as well, it's easier to get into the weeds of things like Mm. the structure and operational processes and then using that almost as a buffer or a shield to go, well, we we can't do it because actually there's all this stuff underneath that would all need to change and it would be too difficult and people won't, you know. So I, I do think there is something there about you get into that space because that's where you feel comfortable and that's probably a sign that you're not embracing your in a risk taker I guess um in in terms of being in that space for sure and what if you work for someone who you think is too risky and we've we've all worked with people like this I'm sure how how do you approach that without you being labeled as the killjoy or the clipboard yeah. carrying bureaucrat or whatever <laughs> they might call you <laughs> um that is a tricky one, isn't it? Because because some of that might be about the psychological safety point that you raise. Because mm. if you're in a leadership team where it feels psychologically safe, then you are obviously in a better position to be able to challenge some of that than if you're in a team where you think, oh, God, if I challenge it, there's a consequence for me. And I'm really stick. I'm taking too much of a personal risk here. Um, to challenge it but I think it goes back to me for like what's the evidence that you can present so can you have a conversation or bring into the conversation uh, okay if we take that decision are are we all in this room now so you make it less about the individual because it will be a collective decision for your leadership team are we all in this room now comfortable with what the potential consequences might be and actually it might then be your role to 
put into that space the consequence that nobody's yet mentioned because obviously it might not be in that risk taker's best interest to look at all the consequences because they're only focused on the one that they are hoping to get from it so I think there's ways you can do it in a measured and balanced way that maybe makes it less feel less like it's about an individual but I also think it's back to that understanding their preference and their type and looking at how you might have to adapt your communication style or approach to be able to kind of reach them in in a way that will be meaningful for them and maybe get themselves to kind of check in on on kind of how they're operating yeah I I was having flashbacks as you were talking to um, (laughs) Uh oh good or bad (laughs) in between I always think sometimes you know people would probably say that I was someone that was stifling people taking the actions they wanted to take that I and I would say that they were well I won't say what I would say about them here but (laughs) (laughs) that's like an EastEnders moment cliffhanger won't you why not (laughs) but the risks that they were like hadn't gone through the process yeah and and I remember some service changes that um people wanted to take and the driver for the service change was multifaceted but the primary one that was pushing certain individuals uh, appetite to just effing do it was a financial one and I had to bring up the other risks in if we took this particular approach and how in the end I managed to kind of get everyone to see sense and we we found a way through that helped meet a common purpose that we all had but it was going back to what is it that we're striving to do as an organization and most importantly what is it our stakeholders will expect of us and posing that question in there you're right about psychological safety I I did feel in that instance safe enough or I just didn't care how they reacted because I felt so passionate (laughs) which is sometimes can can over can top trump the uh, the uh, safety Safety. element of it but um yeah I think I think it's remembering that purpose stakeholder outcome that you're striving for and actually if you can bring the voice of others into that room sometimes that is hard to argue against isn't yeah. it so actually if if the strength of opinion and voice and evidence is one way that individual who might be totally set on a different course of action regardless of the risk will find it very difficult to yeah continue without properly having a debate and conversation about the evidence that's being you know brought into yeah. the space and I think there's, I, I would just reference people to the difficult conversation episode that we had yeah. as, as a way to think about how you might frame feedback to someone who you perceive is being too risky or taking undue risk when they don't they don't need to be. Um, and it, and it goes, yeah, evidence was the thing that we spoke about a lot in that episode. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, definitely. Um, and I suppose my penultimate question is one around. When you feel that the level of risk that you're comfortable with is not aligned with your peers or the board, how do you start to navigate that and take people with you? And some of it we've probably picked up in the two other examples of of not risky enough and too risky. But is there anything else that you would do in that situation? For me, it's about how able are you to have that open and transparent communication and conversation about that yeah. and actually there like you've just you've just said it in your example there will sometimes be that point in time where actually the misalignment is maybe because your own values or integrity feels like it's being challenged or you potentially don't feel like people have weighed up all of the pros and cons of something and done that due diligence and there might just be that point where you, you do just need to raise your hand and flag that in a conversation. So I think your ability to be able to say you don't feel comfortable with something and then give that explanation as to why you don't feel comfortable is really important. But equally, I think that personal insight into where might that misalignment be coming from is also crucial because if that misalignment is coming just because it's not in your nature to feel like you want to take a risk and it just feels 
generally personally uncomfortable for you, that's not always a reason to challenge and not take it. It might be a reason to challenge yourself and your thinking. Mm. But actually, if that misalignment is coming because you are working through the potential consequences for the organisation and going, and my alarm bells are ringing because there's a red flag here because we haven't talked about the impact on this group of people, on our reputation, on our finances, whatever it may be. I think that's the point where it's the onus is definitely on you as a leader to bring that into the conversation. I think, and I think the word vulnerability came to mind as you were talking because there's something about as a leader being comfortable with showing our vulnerabilities mm-hmm. um, and it, particularly when it comes to big decision making like this although these might not necessarily all be big decisions but when it comes to how different people might feel about taking certain actions or inactions or decisions that you know showing your vulnerability in that space is can be a really helpful important put whatever word there you want a way to earn trust of people yeah. and that's that's what's key if you're going to navigate board and peer discussions and take people with you it's mm. trying to find that that common sense and connection isn't it yeah absolutely so to wrap things up how how do you embrace your inner risk taker <laughs> My top tip would be back to that. Ask yourself, what's the worst thing that can happen if I do or don't do this? Whatever the thing is, the decision you make, the action you're going to take, like just ask yourself that question. And as you're answering that question with your feedback from other intelligent sources as well, that I think that will help you to work through whether or not you're comfortable taking taking that risk. So that would be my sort of starting point, I think, for people who may be more risk adverse. I love that. I would say just a practical thing that you might want to do to ref- as a as a reflection exercise to understand how risk averse or risk pro risk you are, whatever the the offer. I know I don't actually know what the opposite. I say risk adverse a lot, but I'm like, what's the opposite of being risk risk? Don't know. Yeah, pro risk taker, pro risk, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Um, is to and it's something that I I suggest to leaders quite often is to keep a bit of a log of decisions that you're making during a week or a month, and having that reflection piece of like, what was the hope in this taking this decision? Did I you know did I go through the steps? Was I did I think through? Outs- I hate the phrase outside the box, but you know, you can challenge if, if once you start to get clarity in the decisions you're being asked to make, there's so much you can do with that as a, as a piece of information to understand yourself as a leader. And one of them would be understanding the types of risks you're being asked to take or that you're perhaps suggesting you make. Love it. That is a good and really practical thing that people could just start doing tomorrow or yeah. whenever after they've listened to this episode. So I really love that one. Yeah. I might well do it myself, actually. I think you should. <laughs> anyway, it's lovely to talk to you on this uh, topic. Thank you to everyone that's watched or listened. Um, head over to Substack for some further Yes, support. please do. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they are yet, but but they'll be there by the time this is published. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, comment. We'd love for you to get involved in the discussion. So let us know what you think about risk. Let us know how risky you think your organisations and leaders in your organisation are. Let us know what you do to step into your inner risk taker. Yeah. Anyway, till next week. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to hit follow to make sure you get the next episode. And if today's discussion resonated, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We also have our Substack community where you can get behind the scenes info, ask us anything sessions and build your network with like-minded leaders. Visit howtotakethelead.substack.com to find out more. And if you want to work with us to challenge and change leadership in your organisation, get in touch by dropping us an email, howtotakethelead at gmail.com or DM us on the socials. Until next week, get out there and take the lead.